This year marks 500 years since Martin Luther first challenged the indulgence system in the Catholic Church in 1517, and uh, he nailed those 95 theses to the door of the church there. That was how he got that discussion started. That's how you did that back then. So we are going to be reflecting on the lessons learned there. We have a memory verse that we're going to be learning here. Let's say it together. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. That's what we'll be learning these coming months. We're going to look at Galatians 1 in just a moment. Galatians 1, that's in the New Testament. We're going to be going through the book of Galatians leading up to a Reformation Sunday this year. I'm going to give you a little backstory though before we actually do this reading because there's some things going on here. So this backstory here, I have a little map of Galatia there. It's kind of it's kind of in the middle if you can kind of see where Asia is in the center. It's just a little bit to the right there. Paul first preached Christ to Galatia. He was the first one who first told them who Jesus was and what he what he is about. And it was because of an illness that it says in Galatians. It was probably on his first missionary trip where he stopped and, and he actually preached to them. He was there again in his second trip and in his third trip. So he was here a lot. And so he knew these people really well. But after he had gone through there and he had taught them about who Jesus was, there were other teachers who came through with a different message. From what we can tell... In this epistle to the Galatians, we don't know exactly what they said, but we can tell a little bit from what he said in response. These people taught that Jesus is only the first step in salvation and that there's more things to do after that. They taught that true Christians must be circumcised and obey the Old Testament holidays, those Old Testament laws. And so, For them, faith in Christ had a role, but justification wasn't complete without observing the Old Testament law, preserving for the Gentiles a great heritage of Judaism with its ethical guidance, is what they would have said. But these people, they wanted to win converts for their own prestige, but they also had a few other things in mind here too. First of all, it wins the approval from Jewish authorities by converting Gentiles to Judaism, and it escapes them from suffering Jewish persecution, which was going on a lot there, but it also creates their own sect of Christianity, of which they themselves are the leaders and and the apostles. And so they kind of put Paul down a little bit. They said Paul is only a junior apostle. He was not the real thing, he was just kind of a follower. He was a secondary apostle sent by the real apostles. He didn't personally know Jesus like the twelve did, and so he wasn't as good as they were. He was taught about Jesus by Peter and James and some others. And uh, he's only teaching the first step of salvation. He's not teaching you the rest. And he's doing that because he wants to put the bar low so he can win as many converts as possible. So he's trying to get you to convert and then... This is what he's leaving out. But he is preaching the full message elsewhere. He's teaching both steps everywhere else. He's just not teaching that here. And so we're going to teach you the second step. That's kind of how it would have went. So Paul writes to them. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, And all the brothers with me to the churches in Galatia, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, 
Let him be eternally condemned. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel other than the one you accepted, let him be eternally condemned. Am I now trying to win the approval of men or of God? Or am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. I want you to know, brothers, that the gospel I preach is not something that man made up. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many Jews of my own age and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God, who set me apart from birth and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not consult any man, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was. But I went in immediately into Arabia and later returned to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Peter and stayed with them 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God that what I am writing you is no lie. Later, I went to Syria and Cilicia. I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report. The man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they praised God because of me. Galatians is an angry letter. If you read through all of Paul's epistles, there's a lot of them that have a lot of thanksgiving and a lot of joy in them. Galatians stands out. He's very angry in this letter. And he's very angry not because his pride is hurt, not because he's losing influence. He's angry because the gospel is at stake. This is a very forward, very aggressive letter. And I I don't know if you picked it up as we were reading through there. But let's let's imagine that that I, I come in on some Sunday morning here. And I stand up here and I say, good morning. And then I say something like this. I am shocked that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and you're turning to some other gospel and it's no gospel at all. Evidently, there's people throwing you into confusion and they're trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But, but let me say this. If, even if me, even if I or some angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one that you accepted, then you know what? They can go to hell. I've said it before, I'll say it again. If anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than the one that you accepted, they can go to hell. That's how he's writing. The gospel is at stake. And he's angry because this is so important. And he loves these people. You can tell it later on. The true gospel is being compromised along with the salvation of those he loves. This is not just trivial stuff. This is salvation. He says to them later on in this epistle, My dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you, how I wish I could be with you now and change my tone because I am perplexed about you. He's, he's hurting for them. The gospel's at stake. And he states this gospel in verses 3 through 5. He says, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Those verses give the gospel in a nutshell. This is is what he preached. And this this is the whole of it. This is not step one. This is all of it. Because we are all sinners who need salvation from a wicked world. Christ gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age. Now, Now, we would like to think that we're good people. But the truth is, we've cut people down with words. We've ignored people who needed a friend. We've said things that we knew were false. 
We've lusted in our hearts. And we really don't love God. We just want his blessings. If we're honest with ourselves, that's, that's true for us. <laughs> Among other things, we need salvation. All of us do. We need the Lord. And Jesus Christ died for our sins to save us. He gave his life so that we would be saved. The Son of God, he gave his whole life. He didn't just have a nice life and then just died at the end. He gave his entire life so that we would be saved. As a free gift so that we would be saved, even though we didn't deserve it. Jesus is not a first step, but our entire salvation. He's the whole thing. He's the beginning and the end. He is everything of our salvation. He pays for all of our sins, not just some of them. He is how we connect with God in prayer. We pray in Jesus' name. We don't pray in our own name or on our own authority. We pray in His name. He is how we connect with God. And He is our example. His example of radical sacrifice and service. That's how we live our lives now. He showed us this is how you live your life. Anything that makes Jesus only a first step is a false gospel. It's false. It's not just sort of true, it's false. I like how he says, even if we were to preach a gospel, other than that one, even if we did, or even if an angel from heaven should preach another gospel, even if there's an angel that appears right to you and preaches another gospel other than this one, it's false. I don't care how beautiful or bright or amazing that angel is, it's false if it's a different one. And it's a little bit prophetic that he says that because there's a lot of religions that have started that way. I saw an angel appear before me and this is what this angel said. That's how Muhammad started his religious journey. An angel appeared to him and said Jesus wasn't enough. His true words were distorted. And so now you've got to set him straight. That's how Joseph Smith got his start. An angel appeared to him and gave him a whole different book of the Bible called the Book of Mormon. Even if an angel from heaven. Verses 11 and 12 here. I want you to know, brothers, that the gospel I preach is not something that man made up. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. So the gospel is from God, not man. This gospel that Paul had preached to them, it doesn't come from him. If I'm preaching the gospel to you, it's not from me. I'm, I'm relaying what it says here. I'm explaining what the Bible says. That's it. It's not from me. It's from God. So when I'm up here talking, it's not just me that's speaking. I'm speaking, but there's, the Holy Spirit is working through these words in each of your hearts and minds. And that's what I pray about. I pray that every day, that everything that I speak would be applied by the Holy Spirit to your hearts and minds according to your needs. This is not from man. And that's why this is so important. We need to preserve what is from God and distinguish it from what is human and mortal. Because these mortal things will try to enter into this and pollute it. This gospel is what we preach. Look at the screen here, if you would, with me, and let's answer this together. How do you come to know this salvation? The Holy Gospel tells me God Himself began to reveal the gospel already in paradise. Later, He proclaimed it by the holy patriarchs and prophets and portrayed it by the sacrifices and other ceremonies of the law. Finally, he fulfilled it through his own dear son. This gospel 
is revealed in Scripture, the Bible. This is why the Bible is preached here every Sunday. It's not just me talking. I can have come up with my own things to say, but the Bible has things to say. And so one of these things, something that came out of the Reformation, something called sola scriptura. And that means that the Bible is the final authority for all doctrine in life. Everything that we are supposed to do, everything that we are supposed to believe, the Bible has the final authority on all of that. There's nothing else that stands on that same level as the Bible does. Now, it's not the only authority. We have other authorities, of course. You know, the church has some authority. Our parents have authority and so forth. But when it comes to what God has to say, the Bible is the final authority and every other authority is subject to that authority. So there was this survey that's because the Reformation's anniversary is coming up, there was a survey done and they wanted to see, okay, how many people actually hold to this sola scriptura doctrine? And they worded the question terribly. They said, is the Bible the only authority? And then people answered, we don't believe that. We don't believe it's the only authority. We believe it's the highest authority, the final authority. There's other authorities, but this is the final one, and every other authority is subject to this one. The teaching that, that Martin Luther was combating was that the church has equal authority to the Bible, that the church and the Bible are on the same level, and that they, they have each the same authority. And Martin Luther was saying, um, you're, you're basically selling forgiveness for a price. You're selling salvation so you can make money. That's how that they were doing it at the time. As soon as a coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs, was what one famous preacher was saying at that time. The church has authority to interpret, but the Bible is the only infallible authority. There's no mistakes in here. There's mistakes in the church. I make mistakes. Our elders and our deacons, they make mistakes. The Bible, it doesn't make mistakes. When it talks about God... That is something we can hang our hat on. We can stand on it as the final authority. So we have creeds and confessions which are passed down through the church for many, many generations, and they have some authority. They do. We can't just throw that out when we feel like it. But the church must submit to Scripture. Even the church submits to Scripture. I do, everybody does. It's the final authority. And Scripture stands on its own authority as God's Word to us. It doesn't get its authority from any person. It's self-authenticating. You might want to say it that way. There was one um, Roman Catholic uh, little book that I was reading, and it said this about Sola Scriptura. Apart from the declarations of the Catholic Church, we have absolutely no guarantee that what is in the Bible is the genuine Word of God. In other words, unless you have the Church to validate the Bible, we don't know if it's telling the truth or not. I'm, I'm, <laughs> the Bible stands on its own authority. When it talks... It talks with authority. It doesn't need anything to validate it at all. These are the words of God. First Timothy, or Second Timothy rather, 3.16. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. This is from God to us. God doesn't need us to validate him for him to have authority. Isaiah 40, verse 8, The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. This word from God here, this has its own authority. And we need to submit to it. All of us do. And it stands on its own. And there's events that are recorded in here, particularly, especially the events of Christ, that change the entire meaning of our lives. 
as we as Christians, we believe that what this says is true. And because that's true, that means life is totally different now. John 20, verse 31, But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing that you may have life in his name. You can have life. There's words of life here. According to Catholic teaching, it's the church that picked which books were going to be in the Bible. And so for them, the church is what made the Bible and therefore has authority over the Bible. So one of the things that I said, the church with the authority to determine the infallible word of God must have the infallible authority and guidance of the Holy Spirit. That's, that's the logic. But that's backwards, actually. The truth is, is that God's word produced the church. We didn't produce the Bible God's Word produced us. It's the Word of God, in the very beginning, for that matter, that produced the whole universe. God spoke and things came to be. Then God spoke His Son into our lives, and now we are here. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the Word of God. The Word is from God, and therefore it preceded and produced the church. Your Bible reading track for today is 1 Peter 1, 23-25. It says, For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring Word of God. You are born again through this Word. For all men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the Word of the Lord stands forever. And this is the Word that was preached to you. You're here this morning because you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that He is the truth. And so you're here today to hear more of that truth and to participate in these sacraments that He gave to us because of who He is. He is the Word. And we have this Word in written form. This is what produced us. We're not here today to make this. This made us. We congregate because we believe the truth of the gospel that is revealed in Scripture. And we need to be continually produced and shaped by this Scripture too. That's why we preach the Word every week. We need to be continually shaped and molded by what this says here. We need to continually change our lives. We need to continually repent. And we need to continually remember who God is. It's very easy to forget about God. We need to celebrate Jesus each week together. That's what we're doing here. And we need to do something each day. Each day we need to ground ourselves in what this says. That's why there's Bible reading tracks in your bulletins. Because I want to encourage you to read the Bible every day. Even if you don't follow those tracks, I hope that you're in the Word every day. Because this is the words of life the gospel that is our salvation. Each day, ground yourself in the truth of the gospel that's revealed in the Bible. We can't be grounded enough in this truth. We can't be grounded in it enough. The truth of Jesus that's revealed in Scripture. So be grounded in that each day this week and always. Let's bow our heads and let's pray together. Lord our God, thank you for your word and your spirit that teaches us this gospel of salvation, this gospel of Jesus Christ that is so important for us. Please apply it to us and keep us grounded in it each day, Lord, so that we would be your people. In Jesus' name, amen.